Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here, looking at how cell theory frames our modern understanding of cells. Uh, in this video, I'm mostly gonna focus on cell membrane and uh, the structure of those cell membrane and the transport of materials into and out of cells. There is another video that's gonna focus on the other areas of cell theory. I'll talk about those in just a minute and I'll show the link for that. I'll also put that in the list of videos for the playlist and I'll link it to the homework. So when you talk about cell theory, we know that all cells are composed of uh, cells. Cells come from other cells and cells are the basic structure and function of living things. So here we have a eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic cell. And again, I have a video called Cells Basics that's gonna go through uh, the difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. I'm also going to have in that video a discussion of all of the uh, structures found within the different cells. I'll also compare and contrast plant and animal cells. So let me uh, just put the link here. And again, I'll put that in the homework sheet. I'll also put that within the playlist. So let's move on to the main focus for this video, which is to talk about the structure of cell membranes and how it relates to their functions. So for this, let's take a look over here and we can see that this is the phospholipid bilayer. Now the phospholipid bilayer is composed of predominantly phospholipids. And so we can see a phospholipid here and then also membrane proteins that are embedded within there. And so we call the the phospholipid bilayer a fluid mosaic model because what it is is these proteins and lipids uh, mixed together and these proteins are not in any set fixed location they can move around within here um, it's a fairly dynamic structure um, I'll probably post another video uh, up that has some examples of some of the fluid dynamics that are involved with membranes. But just know the term fluid mosaic model is often thrown uh, together for this, and the mosaic being the different lipids and different proteins uh, come together in a tile fashion. Now, what are these proteins that we have uh, sticking in here? You can notice that there are many different roles. Um, some of these are channel proteins, and we also have some receptor proteins. And then we in also have some proteins that serve as surface markers. And so these proteins are gonna very much help the cells get materials in and out, help the cell identify itself as the type of cell that it is, and it will also be involved with some communication uh, that's really what we're talking about when we look at receptors and surface markers. Uh, they're either receiving signals from other places or they're going to consider themselves a, a marker. So if we think of something like an immune function, for example, how does your body know the difference between your cells and, say, a bacteria? Uh, it looks at these proteins that stick out and it can identify these different shapes. We'll talk a lot more about that in various functions, particularly when we get to the human body and the immune system later on. So one of the questions that sometimes comes up is why are cells so small? And that's why I have this diagram over here on the right. And what we find is that as cells get larger, um, their surface area and their volume both increases. But what we find is that the surface area to volume ratio ends up getting much smaller. So as the surface area increases, the volume increases much faster, and therefore it's harder for materials to get into and out of cells very easily. So what I'd like you to do is pause and think, and how could a cell deal with this problem if it's growing and all of a sudden its surface area and volume ratio is starting to get small? What would be the solution for that from a cellular perspective? Why don't you pause and think? What do you think cells do when their surface area to volume ratio uh, becomes a problem? So hopefully what you came up with is that cells divide. And so what we see here in this particular uh, image is that if we have a one by one by one square um, that has a surface area of six and a volume of one, and so the surface area to volume ratio is six. But if we make a five by five by five, the ratio gets um, much less advantageous and becomes a 1.2. It has 150 squared surface area and it has a 125 cubed volume. There should be some units on here, but we do not have units. Now, if I divide that five by five by five into individual one 
by one by one cubes and I can divide up and have a whole bunch of them, what I find out is that I'm increasing the amount of surface because I'm slicing that up and creating surface in between all of those and I'm restoring it to that six to one surface area to volume ratio. And now the cells can get materials in and out very, very easily. And so this is one, one of the reasons why cells divide is it allows uh, materials to get in and out of cells in an advantageous way. So one of the things that we talk about is the movement of materials in and out. And we're going to use water as our uh, example of how things get in and out. The movement of water is a special type of diffusion known as osmosis. So osmosis is going to specifically refer to water, but let's break it down into the different components. Diffusion is the movement of materials from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So the example I always like to give in class is that I spray a perfume bottle in one corner of the room, and what we'd find is the people who are closest to that area will smell the perfume first, and then the people on the far side of the room will smell it much later as the material slowly moves from area of high concentration to low concentration. Didn't put any energy, the particles just move around in random directions and they end up uh, distributing themselves equally throughout the space just through the movement of the molecules uh, around that room. Now, if what we have is we have more water on one side of a membrane and less water on the other, the water is going to move from the area of high concentration to low concentration. The movement of water is specifically referred to as osmosis. So in these particular conditions, I have some plant cells along the top and animal cells along the bottom. And in these conditions, what we're going to do is we're going to take a cell and we're going to put it in one of three different types of condition. The first condition that we're putting the cells is known as a hypertonic solution. In a hypertonic solution, there is more water inside the cell than in that hypertonic environment that you're putting it in. In this instance, the water is going to move from the area of high concentration inside the cell to the area of low concentration outside the cell. And what we'll see in the plant cell is that the cell membrane is going to pull away from the cell wall and we're going to shrivel up the space that the cell membrane takes up. This is referred to as plasmalized in a plant cell. In an animal cell, because there's no cell wall, we just see a shriveling up the cell in that hypertonic environment. The middle conditions are known as isotonic, and iso refers to equal, and so in this case we have equal amount of water inside and outside the cell, so water molecules will move across at an equal rate. So in this case we see water moving into the cell and outside the cell at equal rate. Um, we see it's just a regular old plant cell. In fact, this plant cell would be uh, slightly flaccid. It's not going to necessarily be completely standing up. It won't be completely rigid. If this was your you know, tomato plant, the tomato plant would look a little wilty. In the case of animal cells, animal cells are completely happy in an isotonic environment, and so therefore we see these nice happy red blood cells down on the bottom. In a hypotonic solution, hypo, there is more water outside the cell and less water inside. And so what we see here on the far right-hand side is that the water is rushing in and it's creating a turgid plant cell on the top. The water is rushing in. There's a water vacuole in the plant cell. And so it's getting nice and full and inflated. This would be a very happy plant. Plants like hypotonic solutions. And on the bottom, we have an animal cell. And animal cells lack that cell wall on the, along the outside. So hypotonic solutions are actually slightly dangerous to animal cells. And you can see here there's a animal cell bursting because the water's rushing in, it's creating this osmotic pressure and it could cause cells to burst. Um, obviously it would depend on the amount of difference between solute inside the cell and outside the cell, but this in fact can happen. So those are all movement of water. Now when we talk about other transport, we can talk about the movement of material against the concentration gradient. So let's start over here on our left and look at our passive transport that we started with, like we were talking about with water and osmosis. So if you got more material outside the cell and less material on the inside the cell, it can move from area of high concentration to low concentration. That's passive transport we see over on the left. But what if I want to take it from an area of low concentration and move it to an area of high concentration. This would require energy. This is the equivalent of I sprayed the perfume bottle on one side of the room and the people on the far side of the room don't want the perfume to come over. So they're going to plug in a fan. They're going to use some energy and they're going to keep trying to blow that perfume, those perfume molecules back towards the source and they're going to try to concentrate on that one area. And so this is a type of active transport. What you'll notice in these two instances is rather than just moving material 
through the membrane as it is. And some materials that are small enough can go through the membrane. A lot of things that move through membranes are moving through those channel proteins we talked about in that original membrane. And so in the left-hand side, the passive transport, this would be an example of facilitated diffusion. We are moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration, so it's diffusion, but we're having a protein help it out. Active transport is going to be pumping using energy from low concentration to high concentration. So this is one form of active transport. Another type of active transport could be endocytosis or exocytosis. So in endocytosis, what we would have is we'd have materials outside the cell that would get pulled in through the pinching off of the membrane, forming a little vesicle and that would be engulfing or endocytosis. Amoeba actually eat in a form of this known as phagocytosis where they send out pseudopods and engulf their food. If we want to get rid of materials that are in a vesicle outside the cell, we can use a similar process. This is going to be exocytosis, moving stuff from inside the cell out, and we push the vesicle up to the membrane and then release the materials out, and that would be exocytosis. And so both endocytosis and exocytosis also fit into the form of active transport. All right, so I hope that helps out with transport. Again, remember, there's another video that's going to talk about the different types of cells and also uh, the organelles that are found inside cells, and uh, that link is in the playlist also earlier in this show. Hope that helps. I'll talk to everybody soon.